As quilters, it is so exciting to start a new quilt, but we don't always make it to the finish line. Sometimes we get stalled or hung up or not sure what to do, and then we need to find a solution, and I have a quick solution for you today. I'm Leah Louise from Inspired Quilting by Leah Louise, and what if I could show you some easy techniques with the walking foot that will help you finish more quilts faster? You're going to love this. Check out those peonies in the background and the black and white fabrics. Oh, and then the flying geese made from half square triangles. It all goes together so well. And I put these two quilts back to back but they didn't quite fit so I added a piano keyboarder on one side you are going to love this put them together and just find a way to make it work and then use your walking foot to quilt it all together this is a perfect way to quilt your half square triangles even if they are made into flying geese and it works on charm squares too there is so much going on here it's going to take a few minutes for me to show you but let's go ahead and get started I'm ready to look at it now I am excited to get this quilt finished. This is my all blocked in pattern done with black and white batiks and the K facet peonies brocade. Oh my gosh, I love this. And just because it's right here, look at that. You really don't even notice that that's a seam in my uh, in my border, right? I just wanted to point that out because it happened to be here. But I love this quilt. I love all the prints and how these peonies show up throughout the quilt. They're absolutely gorgeous. Now, I have a friend who loves black and white quilts and pink. So I thought this will be perfect for her. What am I going to do for the backing? Well, I'm doing something I've not done before. Check this out. You may remember this from a year or so ago when we were doing some half square triangle um, tutorials and this was one of them that we did and even though this is a half square triangle we made the flying geese and did the drunkard's path which turned out really well and next time I would definitely use the flying geese because it's easier but it just worked good for the tutorial for what we were doing but I had this quilt too and I thought oh, what a great idea to put these two back to back I love it. It's not something I've done generally. If I'm going to, you know, update the back and create something different and unique, I'm going to start from scratch and create it. But I have another quilt top that's practically the same size. Key word here, practically. And that's what brings us to today's tutorial. This quilt measures about six inches bigger on one side. Just one side. The other may be a narrow, and, and we'll, we'll deal with that. We're going to go one step at a time. But how would this look with a fantastic piano key border going down one side on the back of the quilt? So we have all these flying geese just, you know, flying around every which way. And then we're going to come up with our piano. Let me show you how we do these piano keys. I have some fabric ready to go. Luckily, I had saved all my extra strips and pieces in their own bundle. I tend to keep, you know, like black and whites separate from low volume, separate from all the rest of the stuff. Everything else is grouped together, but because these are unique and used differently than the others, um, I keep them aside. So that worked out really well. Now I do have more pieces of this, but this was kind of what gave me the idea is I had these strips and then I had a lot of these narrow strips because what else are you going to do with this? Um, yeah, you can put it in a log cabin, you can do strip quilts, but I really wanted to do something more with them. So I'm thinking about doing a piano key border right along this edge and well you can't really see that let's push that over there it's too much of a bump there we go do it this way i think that works better and so we'll do this and then we'll pop in you know one of these along the way and even though it's not the same fabric this matches the other side but these colors are in here so that's going to work fine and then i'll do this and then i'll do this and oh, and we've got some dark ones. We need to add those in. 
And so we're going to do this and create a fantastic border. I am so excited. What I want to show you is how to make a scrappy piano key border. I've seen where you do it with yardage or pre-cut fabrics. Seldom do you see it done in a scrappy way from scrap strips and that's what I'm going to do. If you've seen the way I do my log cabins, I take my strips and the ones that are the similar size, I will sew them together with a bias seam like this. Actually, it's going to be looking, I can't do it. There we go. Like this. And then I will just sew my strips together and let that seam just run between them and that's fine it actually looks really cool so i will keep the lighter ones in one strip i'll put like these bolder dark um, heavier lines in one strip i'll keep the blacks in one strip once all these loose narrow strips are sewn together then i'll go to my wider set here and I'll do the same thing and I'll sew them at an angle just like I was going to do a uh, binding and then I'll come back and I'll cut them probably in half. I don't want them all to be exactly the same size so we'll kind of see how that works um, depending on the size of everything as I go. Now if you remember on the all blocked in pattern I also use an accent strip next to the border. Let me show you that here. I think yep there it is. So on the side of the quilt, when I create it, because I, I did this and it's, it's a 12 block and I wanted one size to be a little bit bigger, I added this beautiful border just so you can see those fabrics, even though they're throughout the quilt in various sizes. And let's see, some are in the big, you know, the big blocks and some are small. I really wanted to showcase those. And just like the accent strips, in the blocks, I wanted to put one here, but it really needed to stand out. So I did this black one. And I haven't quite decided what I'm going to use for an accent strip on the back, but it's probably going to be something, you know, along the lines of black or very dark. And I just have to see what I have on hand that I can use. So that's where we're going with this. It is going to be gorgeous. So I'll make the piano key border and we'll get that attached and then I'll get everything basted and we're going to quilt this with half square triangles. I think what I'm going to probably do, I don't know whether I'm going to go down the seams or across across the uh, the centers diagonally. I haven't quite decided but I will quilt from this side because these are the smaller squares and I want to pay more attention to these than I do here because this is much bigger. Whatever I quilt on this side will work on that. And just in case you're wondering, I consider this to be the front of the quilt. So it's unusual to be quilting from the back, but that's okay. It's all going to work. I am so excited about doing this. I love that I'm going to use two quilts at once. They'll both be finished at the same time. And then I get to do this border. I've never done a border like this. I know how to do it. And I know it's not going to be difficult, but it just hasn't ever come up. But look at I have all these strips. I have absolutely everything that I need to make it. And oh my goodness, this is going to be a gorgeous quilt. So let me go ahead and I'll get started with all that. And we'll catch up in a minute and I'll show you where I am. My strips are all sewn together, and you can see I just did the bias seam where we sew at a 90 degree, just like we do on our binding. And when you open that out, I just like the look of that. I think it looks better than if we just do a, you know, end of blunt end seam, and you get a better transition between the fabrics. And I, I just really like the look of it. So here's another one here. Same thing. This is a two inch. So this was a one and a half. This is two inch. It's a little bit bigger. And what I try to do is take it from light lines to darker lines, thicker lines. These are the heavy lines and, and just sort of work my way through. So on the transition, it's not quite as stark as this to this. You can see how that might be more evident where this really is not that strong a contrast. And 
it's it's optional to do all this. It's just something I like to do. I enjoy it. So it's absolutely what I do. And see here, very, very black, some white, and much more white. Even though it's it's spread around in a different way and it's lighter, that, that block definitely does stand out more. But look at this. You, you really don't see that transition. And I like it. Now, these big ones, I... Uh, sewed together again with the the bias seam now i did save these triangles when i cut them off and i may use them for something i'm not sure what but i, I am saving them i did not save the two inch oh my gosh they were so tiny there is no way i will ever make a one inch half square triangle but these i'll save you can see here that I went from lights to mediums and then moved into darkers, but they all have a white background. So these are all going to stand out when they're next to each other, regardless of how they're placed, because this has a very, they all have white backgrounds, except of course for the black, but these have a less dense design. The design on these are spread out more where this design is much more close together. And so you're going to get some good contrast with all these coming together. And then, you know, you put the uh, the piece of black in there, which really will stand out great. And then we put in some of our our pinks and it's it's going to make a great border i can't wait i am so excited to do this so let me go ahead and start putting some pieces together um, i need to figure out first just how i'm going to do that so i will show you and then we'll go from there my first set of strips are sewn together and i sewed them to the shortest length and then i left about three inches rather than sewing right to the end. So if I need to add extra strips, I can certainly do that. But I just made sure that my fabrics didn't match, except for where they did, but you know, that's minor. Oh look, and well, I sort of did it here too, <laughs> but who's gonna notice, right? I don't worry about those things. Not when you're doing something scrappy like this with lots of pieces, those things are just gonna blend into the background. So I just pressed everything to one side and this strip right now measures five and a half inches. So that's perfect. Now, I think that's perfect because what I'm going to do here is I'm measuring my quilt. So let's take a look at how this is all going to go together. The first thing I want to do is measure the biggest quilt because the back needs to match this. The back quilt, which is the half square triangle, is a 50 inch square. This one is bigger. And this one measures 57 by, I think this dimension is 53. And we're gonna talk about a couple things measuring here in just a moment. And let's see, is that 53? I can't quite get there. Yes, so that's right at 53 inches. Now, did you notice that I'm measuring across the middle of my quilt? I don't measure on the outside edges. Always fold your quilt in half. In one direction, measure it, and then the other direction and measure it. And let me show you why. This is going to be more accurate because your outer edges can stretch and you know get kind of mangled as you're sewing and moving things around and if i would have come here whoops sorry for hitting the camera i would have been off by you know that's easily an inch now which do i go by this or this what i'll do is i'll take the middle it's going to be somewhere in between and then we squeeze everything together and it works beautifully and i have a square quilt so if you're ever adding borders, remember, measure the center because this isn't going to change. This, because both sides are not sewn together, this ends to flare or this tends to flare out a little bit. And so you're not going to get that consistent measurement. Actually, let's go ahead and just see what we get. Just since we're here and I'm going to put both of them together and let's see, we'll do this one kind of hold them together as we go and this one yeah I haven't thought far enough ahead to how this is all going to quilt how I'm going to 
um, put the quilt sandwich together. How am I going to keep the seam straight? All those kinds of things. But you know what? We'll figure that out when we get there. I'm I'm on a very inspired, creative moment here, and none of that matters because I'll deal with it later. Okay, remember we came up with 53 inches? Look at this. This one's 52, and this one's just shy of 53. So you know something kind of wonky is going on there. But this is all going to work. It just, it always does. And so we know my border on the back of the quilt is going to go the length of this. So the piano key border will be on the back of this. I think I may want to put it to the other side. I haven't decided because now that I think about it, this piano key uh, border is going to have lots of seams in it. And this is a smoother piece. And I, I don't know if I want to put something with all those seams, but yet there's going to be batting in there, so I won't know. I won't know until I put it all together and see how it feels. But those are kind of the things I'm thinking about. Now, the other direction, like I said, the length of it in terms of the same direction as this border is 57 inches. And so I have to make this quilt fit to 57 inches or a bit more on one side. So I do need to determine which is going to be up and down. It really doesn't matter because this is a um, twisty turn pattern. It goes no matter which way it is, unless I want a particular color somewhere. And given this is all just totally getting very scrappy right now, that's not going to matter. First thing I'm going to do, remember we talked about the um, accent strip on the border. So I'm going to do, oh, and look at it, it's the same, I did not even know that was the same. I grabbed it out of my bucket and look, that's kind of fun. It, it looks like this was all a plan as opposed to very haphazard pulled together scraps. So I have one and a half, or excuse me, these are two inch strips for one and a half inch accent and I have about 60 inches worth of it here. So I will go ahead and piece that along the edge of my quilt. I'm just gonna move that out of the way so you can get a visual here of where we are going. And so, okay, we'll do it this way if it's not gonna cooperate. So we'll have this dark strip there, and then these guys are going to come in this way, and we'll have, you know, some pink pieces in there, and this is going to be absolutely wonderful. Now, seven inches. This is going to measure two. I need five inches plus a half inch. I'm probably going to cut this at six inches because I need a little bit in order to um, put a sandwich together and to, to uh, base style this. I haven't quite figured that out, but we're working on it. So if I cut these at six inches, let's see how much this measures. And I'm going to go to my super duper new cutting mat that I absolutely love because it's so easy to work with. Okay, here's 20 inches and we have 30, easily we have 36. And so that means I have six lengths of these. Now this measures five inches. So I, I have 30 inches of my border already finished here. Now remember, I'm going to add some of these, my pink ones. I have the other half of this one strip that, remember the three inch strip, I cut it in half, I have that here. And what I'll do is I'll just sew it in the other direction. Where I started with this one, where did I start? With the um, chevrons, I'll reverse it and start from the other direction. And then that way, it's. I'll, and I'm gonna put it right here. So where is that piece? I know it's here somewhere. Okay, so this is the chevron. I don't wanna start with the same end, so I'll start with this end and I'll put it here. And just make sure there doesn't look to be like there'll be a whole lot of uh, crossover, so that's fine. So that's going to give me an extra inch. So now my five inch becomes six inches and six times six, so now I've got 36 of my what, 57, so I needed another 20 inches. I'm going to be inserting probably a few pieces of this, that, and the other, plus we have some of these. So what I'm going to do, I think, is extend this a bit farther. 
um, I'm going to find some extra pieces of black. What I may do is take this one because this is a long piece and this one's short and that way we can incorporate another piece of this and that'll get me kind of up to my probably 45 or so inches and then the rest will probably be this I think and then the extra pieces that I have because what I want to do when I cut these they're going to be sequential. I can twist some around, but remember, I have all these short pieces um, in, in different prints, and I can just put these in in different sizes. Like, look, there's another black one. Oh, here's a black one I haven't used yet. So there are a lot of, oh, and this is a fun one. These I just had in short lengths, and I, it didn't make sense to put them in a long strip. So this is how I'm going to make up that difference. Isn't that wonderful for a scrappy design just to take all these pieces, stack them up together, and there you have a border. I love it. So that's where I am next. That's what I'm going to work on. If anything, I might do a narrow one to um, kind of correspond with the narrow accent strips in this all blocked in pattern, which by the way, remember, free pattern, you got to get it. It is such an easy quilt. And that might look good along the bottom because I do have a bit more of this fabric, but we'll see. We'll see what I have left and what I have to work with. But we are on a roll. This is coming together wonderfully. And so it'll be basted soon. And I'm going to be able to quilt this. I am so excited. I can't wait to get it finished. And here we are. I have, uh, what do I have? Five pieces here that are stripped together. I cut off what I had on loose ends and I added it to the other side so I had a nice good width and I'm going to measure my length on my nifty new 70 inch long cutting mat. Oh my gosh, I am loving this. And this is 48 inches to get to the, uh, to the end of the shortest piece. Now, that means uh, what I plan to do is, I talked about cutting this at six and a half inch blocks in order to make my border, but I do need to go to seven inches. This is going to be the back of my quilt, and when I'm basting, I need this to extend out beyond the quilt on top. So that 7 inches is going to give me the extra space that I need to work with. So as I'm cutting this, um, I was taking a look, and what do you know? Sometimes when you're dealing with scraps, you just don't know what you're going to come across. You see that, that tear in there that my finger comes through? So I'll cut my seven inch as far as I can to here, and then I'll go to the other side and work from that end. And then once those seven inch pieces are cut, I can start putting my peonies in. But remember, these were only 12 inches, so they'll be six inches a piece. So I need to think about that. I have some longer pieces. And this is the thing about a scrappy quilt. You never quite know how everything's going to go together, but it does. And what I'm going to do is just pull the pieces I have, start assembling it, and in order to, I need to put this pin somewhere, in order to put these together, so I'm going to cut them into sevens, what I will do is take a piece like this off the other end, and I'll insert it in the middle, because this then, you know, put a red stripe in here, um, a nice little pretty pink stripe strip of fabric and then I'll put a piece like this and then add another one of these and maybe turn it around the other direction. That way it's not going to be a repetitive pattern of fabrics. It's just going to be a whole lot of stuff going on and that's what I like. I don't want someone to come up and say one, two, three, four, five, pink. One, two, three, four, five, pink. I don't want that. And it's too matchy-matchy. I love asymmetrical. So I need to change that up. And I probably go to more trouble than I need to to do that. But it's important to me, so I do. Now, if you do not have strips that you're working with that are nice and even, like I had a lot of two and three inch strips that had been pre-cut and they were left over in my scraps, you can use wonky pieces. Let's say you have pieces like this and one's narrow, one's wide. Piece it with something else that maybe has a different direction or narrow strips or put two pieces together. We're making a scrappy quilt and if you do something like that, that's going to add so much interest to your border. And I think you might really like trying that. And that's something I could certainly do here is put in some 
um, you know, pieces that maybe go a little bit like this. But because everything is so straight, that will really stand out too much. And I can't hide these pretty pink fabrics. They need to stand out and shine. So that's my next, uh, my next step is to cut these into seven inches. See about piecing this, how many um, strips I'll get in, how many I'll need, what I'll need to do. One other thing is the advantage to having a, a extra piece, you know, mixed in. Get some wide pieces, like use a piece like this on one end. That way, if you need to trim, you've got plenty of room to make adjustments so that your border is going to fit. And this, I think, is, yes, seven inches. So I can put this on one or both ends, and then that way I have the flexibility to get my border to fit right where I need it. Okay, so those are all the things I can think of to talk about right now. I'm really excited about this. This is coming along fun. And look at how wonderful this border is going to look. I did cut them all at seven inches, and I came up with six pieces of the pink. But I had two left over, because remember they were 12 inches, so I had two five-inch pieces left. And look at what I did. I have to find it. Oh my goodness, it's almost invisible. Look at this. I did a diagonal seam, and I matched the black and white. And look at that. You don't even notice that. So that is going to fit perfectly. Oh, you can't see over there. <laughs> and and I'll show you that. So what I'm going to do is go through and sew everything together in pairs. I'll, th I'll sew two pieces all the way through, and then I'll see where I am on my dimensions because I need to figure out where the seam allowance is going to be. And then I have these extra pieces if I need to add spacers in there, you know, to make it come together. But do notice that I, I sort of switched my blocks this way. And so some of the blacks are close together. Sometimes they're farther apart, then they're close together. Because I, like I said, I don't want everything um, to be the same. I want it to look um, randomly organized. That's the word. That's the phrase that we need to go with. So let me sew these into pairs and I'll show you how this is going to come out. It's really coming together. With my pair sewed together and then another pair sewn together, I'm down to four pieces of my border. This one has the wide end down here and what I've done is I've laid it out with my seam allowance overlapping at each point. And right now this measures 59 inches and I need 57. And because I have this extra piece, I have plenty to cut off. And I am going to go ahead and sew this together. My goal before I stop and take a pause because it's getting late and it's raining outside and it's a good time to go to bed is I want to get this border on that quilt just so we can see what it looks like. I think it's going to be so much fun. All right, let me go ahead and get this sewn together. Check out this gorgeous border. The accent strip is the perfect break between the quilt and the piano keys. And look at how wonderful all those prints just look together. I love it. Now, this will be the finished end. So I have that even, and I'll cut it off. Now, I know there's always those of you out there who do the math along with me. And generally, um, you always find a mistake that I made, because I do. I catch it eventually, but oftentimes you'd catch it before I do. So let's go back over this. I have a 50-inch square right here. And I need it to be 57 by 53. And so I made this seven inch border with an inch and a half. And I cut this at like seven inches just so I have an extra um, bit to overhang with in order to base my quilt. So I have more than enough trim room over here. Now I measured it and made this to be 57 inches, but I don't need 57 in this direction. I only need 53. This is my 57. This is my 53. So when I got down here, I have a little extra, and that's okay. It's time to take a break. I'm pretty happy with what we've finished here. And the next step then is going to be finishing that border on that side and then quilting. It's awesome. It's coming together great. 
half square triangles can be challenging to quilt with if you get too caught up in the angles and the points where they join. Now you saw previously, just a couple weeks ago, I quilted the converging squares half square triangle quilt. And what I did is that was sort of a square in a square pattern. And I sewed right along the inside of the seam. I went about a half inch. And you can choose either side, whether it be this side or this side. The key is just be consistent throughout your quilt. And that's also a good way to check your seam allowance. Because as I'm sewing, I can make sure that my presser foot is you know so far from one side or the other of the line and i'm probably going to sew on this side now what i need to do though as i'm backing up as you notice this square has a line going in the opposite direction so how am i going to know where i'm going to quilt so what i do is i take my ruler and i lay it in line with this half square triangle and it goes right up, let me just get that right there, and that goes right up here and I've marked that line. So this spot here, this line that I've drawn, is in the same line as this. So all I have to do is sew down here to here. And I'll keep my ruler handy in case there comes a point that I do need to mark a spot for whatever reason. That way as I'm going along, if I need to mark any more spots where I'm not clear where the line's going to be, I can just pick it up easily and uh, do that. And of course, this is the disappearing ink, which is awesome. So I'm going to put my presser foot just not quite a quarter of an inch. I will start outside of the quilt because I don't want my thread to get, there we go, knotted up on the back. So I have a nice new needle in here. It's a size 11, which is a good size needle for just lightweight cottons and a lightweight batting. This is 100% cotton. It's the toasty cotton that I really like. It's a low loft, so you can tell it's thin, so the quilt isn't super heavy. If you go with heavier batting or wool batting or heavier fabrics, like maybe flannels or denim, denim you will definitely need a larger needle. And a 14 to a 16 works good. And the reason being, is the needle is larger it makes it a little bit bigger hole so the thread goes in and out more easily and there's less tension issues and less uh, thread breaking just you know consider what you're working with and go from there i have my walking foot which i always quilt with it is such an easy way to work um, through a quilting project because it just feeds things along. Remember, it has feed dogs on the top as well as the ones on the bottom, and they work together to bring your whole quilt through at one time. And of course, my quilting gloves can't go without it. So let me go ahead and get started. I'm starting in one corner and I'm going to go all the way to the other side. Now, this quilt is not exactly a square, I think it's like 50 by 57, somewhere in that range. And so I'll come out um, just off corner on the other side, but that's okay because I'm just going to keep quilting to this side. I start in the middle and I work to one side, turn it around and I'll start on the opposite side and work that way. This is the best way that I find that I can keep the least amount of fabric stuck inside my machine and everything is far more manageable that way. So let me go ahead and get this first line of stitching in. And I'm just going to sew across everything. And then when I get to the next angle, that next corner, I want to be the same distance as I was up there. As you're quilting, I recommend that you fan fold your quilt in your lap so that the farthest end you're going to sew goes in your lap first and then the rest just sort of fan folds over and as you're quilting you can just lift from the top and there's no tension there's no pulling and you don't have to worry about um, your quilt sandwich stretching in one direction or another now as i quilt my hands are out like this and i'm just slightly 
stretching this taut. And I say stretch loosely. I don't mean I'm pulling it, but I'm just holding it so there's no wrinkles because I don't want any wrinkles or tucks on the bottom. And this is the best way to do that. Just kind of spread your hands out like you're, you're pressing, like you're ironing it with your hands. And we'll go to the next corner. And I generally go corner to corner. I go corner to corner because it allows me to set my hands and get the next area ready to quilt. And that way I can stop on or near a seam. Because chances are when you stop and go to start again, that's often a place where your needle might just, you know, bump a little bit. The fabric is maybe pulling in one direction. When the needle lifts, that fabric moves. So you want to make sure you're nice and straight. And again, keep your fabric taut so you're right up close there. And then lift your needle and make sure that fabric doesn't jump one way or the other. If you notice that it's in one you know, one side too far, you can just gently maneuver it with your fingers. But I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about it here. I didn't quite make it the whole way, but that's okay. I'll stop with my needle down and just come right through here. Now again, half square triangles. We have angles along the way. What I want to do is line this up this corner with my next corner right here and actually I can see it well enough all I'm going to do is put a mark here so I know that's my center point and that's where I need to sew along all right get myself situated and I'm always kind of making sure this fabric over on this side isn't getting too bulky if it does then I'll start rolling it up all right, so I'm at that seam. Now I'm going to go to the next spot where I have marked. This is the outside of my presser foot. That's not the sewing line. That's the line where the diagonal seam would be if it were there. And so I'm just going to maneuver myself right down to that point. And once you get this first line in, this is probably the one that's going to take the most time simply because you're getting your quilting line placed and you're getting that diagonal set along the way. And because this is done in a flying geese pattern, then not all the angles are going in the same direction. So we just need to make sure that we are following the right line. And as I'm coming down here, this is the line I'm going to join up with right there. See how that goes? through the center of this corner and then into the next one. So that gives us an idea of where we're going. Okay, and I'm going to adjust this. Now what's nice is as I'm quilting, I'm going to start back up in the same corner as I did for this line of quilting and then I'm going to work my way to the outer edge. As I do, this amount of fabric will decrease quickly. You'll see what I mean because as I'm sewing, whoops, let me get this thread out of the way here. As I'm uh, quilting through and, and sewing along here, I move this out. What is that going to be? Roughly, well, it's less than four inches, maybe three and a half inches. We're going to sew continuously on this line across the entire quilt and then we'll go back to the top and we'll come down and parallel the same stitching line, but we'll just do it on the next seam. So this first one gets a little fussy just because you're sort of paving the way of uh, the direction that you'll be going. Now here's a spot where we're going to be going across a number of different uh, corner points and we just want to make sure we stay straight. Now if you want, you can, you know, you can make patterns and and follow different um, angle lines throughout your quilt. I'm just doing straight diagonals and that's a great easy way to get started and it goes relatively quick. So this might be your best choice for your first try and once you get your you know half square triangle quilt finish or do a sample you know put about 12 blocks together and try it out and see what works for you then you can come back and try some other more intricate quilting patterns um, that work on angles that you may like better
All right, now this one I'm just going to come straight through along this line here, but I'm tucking this over on this side because I want to keep this fabric nice and straight. I don't want this pulling down like that because that's where you can get tucks in because the fabric is also bunching up on the bottom. If it's bunching up on top, you know that's what's happening on the bottom as well. So both hands in place, get everything where I need, and then start sewing. I'm going to continue right through this corner over that seam line. I'll stop right there. And what I want to show you is we're coming up to this corner down here. And we know that this is where the seam line is. Whoops, the purple works better for me on this color. This is where our seam line is because it goes through that intersection. And what I want to do is just line it up straight. So I'm going to put my ruler across that seam line there and line my ruler up right here. And then I'll put this mark here. Now, this isn't necessary, but I think, you know, while you're quilting, you may not need to do this. But what I want you to see is I'm guiding myself with these marks to stay in line with the half square triangle corners. Now, certainly, if you want to, ahead of time, you could take a long ruler and draw the line from corner to corner. That's entirely up to you. There are a number of different ways you can do this. But I'm going to go ahead and just continue sewing. As I approach these next two lines that I'm going to sew along, I want to pull my quilt through. You know, periodically as I stop, I want to make sure that everything's nice and even and I'm not getting too much stretch this way. Because then, you know, if I'm letting this build up, then the quilt kind of gets a bit twisted. And that's when you can have problems with your backing not laying flat. So let's go ahead and we'll get this lined up here. My presser foot will go right to the inside of that spot. So there I am there. And I'm going to do the same thing at this corner. And again, I'm lining my fabric up as I go, getting my quilt sandwich right where I want it. And we'll go to the next spot. Okay, now here, get this tucked in there. I have, I always check to make sure nothing's folded underneath. Have you ever done that, been quilting and find out a corner got tucked under? Oh my gosh, that's so frustrating. Yes, it happens. But anyways, we're not going to let that happen today. So this is the line that I'm meeting up with. See, I've got this diagonal, so I'm going to come right to the inside of this corner. Now, I could mark this center line, but visually I can see where I'm going. So I'm just going to go ahead and rely on that. Like I said, this is not about perfection. Um, this is just getting a nice diagonal line in that's going to play off on the pattern that we have with our Hasbro triangle. I'm going to stop and adjust right here because I can feel this building up. And that's because this is the thicker part where the um, corner of the quilt is over here. Remember, I'm sewing on a diagonal across this quilt. And I'm going to make sure everything in my lap is ready. And look at that. Everything's nice and smooth. I'm good to go. And as I come into the corner, Again, I'm just going to place everything, make sure I'm good, and I'm just going to follow. Now, my corners are not perfect, and that's quite all right. I don't have a problem with that. And so what I'm going to do is just come across and just kind of split the difference and then just keep on going because that's, that's really very minimal. Now, sometimes if you have a long stretch like this on a diagonal line, you might not be able to get all the way through to the other end. And you're better to stop and, you know, reset yourself than try and pull through because that's when you can create problems on the underside of your quilt. And, you know, when you're quilting, that's where the um, most challenging spot is because you can't see the underneath and you don't know if there are wrinkles or things are, you know, tucking together. So we just want to make sure everything's as flat as it can be. And then now I'm at my corner. So I'm going to come, I have a, a corner here that I can see visually and I'm just going to come to the inside of that corner. And 
I'll sew right off the edge and I'll cut my threads and then I'm going to pull it through and we will get the other side or the uh, the next row next to it done. So I'm just going to pull this through and as I do just look at it and you know see how we've got this nice diagonal line and it's mostly straight it's a little wobbly here and there but I'm okay with that you know there's nothing and you can see right here see that little spot I'm gonna hold it up and see if you can where I stopped in the seam and obviously my needle jumped over just the littlest bit but that's hardly visible so don't worry about those little th oh look at it happened twice in a row I must have uh, either been talking too much not paying attention or let this quilt over here build up and uh, not get it smooth enough okay so the, oh, there's one so there we are so I had trouble in the beginning getting myself straight now that I have this first line in the rest of the quilting is going to go much easier so I'm just going to pull myself over here and I'm going to go on this side of the the uh, seam just like I did before as you do this more you'll become familiar and comfortable with coming to this point seeing where your foot is going to align up and then go back off the edge of the fabric just so you know you're going to be in line with where you want to be that just you know makes it easy for me if like I said if you're more comfortable putting some ruler lines in initially absolutely that's a great way to do it and there are a lot of products that are um, disappearing or removed with water or chalk that can be wiped off so just find what works best for you and uh, make sure you're quilting that's the big thing and I'm just going to continue along until I get to the other end and I'll meet you there unless I come across something in particularly uh, interesting that I want to share with you in the meantime though while I'm quilting I always think about what kind of binding I'm going to use I'm pretty sure it's going to be black and white so I have some ideas I haven't quite finalized as I'm reaching the corner to uh, finish quilting at this area I'm going to need to draw a line because this is not the half square triangle this is my piano key border and it goes in a completely different direction and I don't want to try and guess my way through so what I've done is I brought my two and a half inch ruler and it just so happens that this seam that I sewed is two and a half inches from my pressure foot. So what I'm going to do then is just put a line right here and I know if I sew along that line I'm going to be good. Now I'll probably need to actually that's going to take me right off the edge of my quilt. So that's all I need to do. So let me go ahead and show you that part. Oops, let me get back on there. I'll sew right across that line. You can see here's the edge of the quilt right there. And there we are. So my second row of quilting is done and I'll just keep lining up and doing the same. Then as I get closer to the corner, I'll check back in with you and show you how it's going. And I made it all the way to the corner. You can see as I got into my uh, piano keys, I just drew lines that were in line with the previous quilting coming through. So as I drew the line, I know where to put my presser foot so that everything was nice and neat. And then when I got down to the corner, I just drew one last line here and we're good to go. Now, alternatively, your walking foot may have a guide. Uh, my guide doesn't go quite this wide. This is probably close to three inches and I'm not real sure how different guides are with different walking feet. So you just need to, you know, see what the, the width is that you can go with. Now I chose this width simply because it was evenly between my half square triangles and that was easy for me to measure. Now you can certainly go through and put them closer together like every two inches. You can even come back now and come through the center if you want heavier quilting on here. And that's just a matter of what you want to do. Now I am going to flip this around and do the other half so that everything is done all in one direction. And I just want to show you as we go up you can see all the quilting lines and it's all the way up the side of the quilt so I've got all these finished 
And when I get up to this corner, what I'm going to do is turn around to the other side, and this is where I'll end. So I'll just turn things from here. So let me go ahead and get that going, and this quilt is going to be finished before we know it. With the first half of my quilt finished, or at least quilted, I do want to show you what it looks like. I'm doing the diagonal from corner to corner. So this is the corner that I just finished, and you can see the approximately three and a half inch um, channels that I'm sewing with my uh, with my walking foot and so this is what I consider the front of the quilt it's the all blocked in pattern it's a free download and I love it because it has big blocks to show off the fun fabrics but yet it also has small blocks where you know you can use those fabrics as an accent so this it's a pattern that I designed a few years ago, and I love it. I, I make it all the time. I make at least a couple of these quilts every year. But I just want to show you um, how awesome it's looking. But what I'm really excited about is the back. But first, just so you can see, I did this diagonal, and you can see this here is where I stop. So now all I have to do is, you know, this corner from here to here, and the quilting is finished. I did go ahead though and trim the two sides for the corner that I completed. And what I want to show you is how awesome the other side looks. I've never thought about doing a quilt um, in a reversible manner. I've created quilt backs that are more elaborate than just a regular quilt back, but I've not actually taken a quilt that I made as a quilt and then used it as a backing. And this has been such fun. I love the piano keys. Oh my goodness, this is fabulous. But just look at how wonderful this quilt is going to be with those colors on both sides. I'm excited about this. And so I told you when, I, when I'm quilting, I think about different things in terms of the quilt and what I might do next time or um, particularly when I'm working on it, what I want to do for the border, or excuse me, for the uh, binding. And sometimes I know ahead of time going in, other times, you know, it's just sort of hit or miss. And because both of these um, were quilts that I had made and are quilting them together, I didn't necessarily have a binding plan. But the common theme here is black and white and then the bold pinks and reds. Now, there's enough color on the front and the back that I didn't want to go with that, but I thought an awesome black and white binding. And of course, the first thought is using a stripe, you know, like a, a pin stripe, which is fun, but there's a lot of lines in here and the quilting is straight and there's angles. I wanted something that wasn't going to be quite so repetitive in that in that way I wanted something that's going to look a little different and here's what I came up with check out this fabric oh my goodness so when it's folded up for binding so we'll fold it in half once we'll sew it on and we'll fold it again I'm going to get kind of a fun <laughs> ironically it's almost a triangular pattern but what I was going for is that it would sort of look like a chevron and that's really going to look neat on the side. I like it much better than just drew, doing, you know, pin stripes or, or um, you know, line work. I wanted something that was heavier. So I am excited about this. Oh my goodness, it's going to look awesome. So that's all I have to do is to finish this uh, side of the quilt. But the piano border, oh. It's fabulous, and it ended up being just shy of five inches. Once I measured the quilt end to end, um, I had five inches, which was awesome. So there we are. It looks great. I'll get it quilted, and uh, I'll get back with you as we start the binding just to show you how that works. And then this quilt's finished. The second half of the quilt is all completed. It's quilted, and I love it. It looks wonderful. Everything went together really well. And so now I just need to trim these last two sides in order to get the binding done. But what I do want to show you is, um, it, it's hard to really see this, but I just, I think it is such fun to have a quilt and it's gonna be bound and then flip it over and there's another quilt. 
I never really thought about doing this before, but I had a couple, a number of quilts, more than a couple, that needed to be quilting. And I've always thought of these two together as being like a set. And when I pulled them out and realized they were very close in size, I thought, oh, here's a new way to go. So I'm really excited about it. And fortunately, let me show you here, when I put these quilts together, you can see that right here is my quarter inch seam for my triangle, my half square triangle. So once I put that there, it's about a half inch. So I'm only losing about a quarter inch of this back fabric. Now, if I were to do this again, I would probably choose one, the smaller one more than likely, and put some extra border around it to give me some wiggle room. This was pretty tight and I, I made it work and that's fine, but I think that would be an easier way to do it um, if you know one quilt isn't larger than the other. The other situation I had is half square triangles. I had to meet these corners. It's not like I could come in. Um, now I can go out and that's what I did on the piano keys but I used this strip to line up along my points. So that kept the pattern intact and my triangles all looked really good. So if I were to come in on this edge and, you know, do something that would cut these off, it would, it would just be too obvious. It would be more evident that I'd want. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, the other thing that is happening is on this side. Now, I made this border extra big. Usually on this particular quilt, I'll do like an eight inch border, but I went big on this because these flowers are so big. Now, fortunately, the biggest flowers are close to the, um, the accent strip because I'm going to lose about two inches, but I'm still going to get most of my big flowers and that, that makes me happy. The alternative was to go in and add another strip here. I had thought about putting the extra row of the uh, piano keys here, but I just liked it. I liked it on the one side. I didn't want to do a second side. It would have been smaller, and I just didn't want to do all that. It's just easier to quilt or to uh, trim this down and put the binding along the edge. So that's what I'm going to do first is get this trimmed up. And then once it's trimmed, all I'll do is put the binding on and we are good to go. So let me get my uh, ruler and we'll get some binding or we'll get some trimming done and then we'll get the binding finished. I'm going to go ahead and get this side trimmed. One thing to think about when you're setting your quilt down to be trimmed you don't always lay it in a nice flat straight manner sometimes we'll pick it up and we'll put it down and and so it gets a bit jumbled and you need to take into consideration that as you're doing this you can be stretching these pieces so let me show you what i have found so let's say i'm doing this and i've got these pieces and i've got the middle kind of straight and i reach out to the sides and i pull my edges down well, what do you think that's going to do? That's probably going to create extra fabric here. Now, it's not a lot. It's only a quarter of an inch, but that's fabric I don't necessarily have to trim off. So instead, what I'll do is I will get to the middle. I'll lay my quilt down, but then I will go ahead and just pull these seams straight. And I'll just kind of pull this down so that I know everything is tucked in well and I don't have any pieces or parts of my quilt being tugged in one direction or another. And then when I lay my ruler down, um, look at everything just lays so well. It's just right in line. And now notice how this end over here, can you see that right there? See how this end wants to kick up? And that's not uncommon. So when it's when it's up like that, I just take my fingers and I just pull it down so it's straight because it wants to be straight. We <laughs> just need to let it have that uh, room to become straight. And I'm going to use my ruler. Now, like I said, you can use a 24 inch ruler, 
But since I bought my supersize mat, I bought the 36 inch ruler to go with it. I cannot tell you how much easier it is for me to square quilts having that extra length on the ruler. It gives me more room to work with and really get a good feel that my my uh, cut is nice and straight and in a line with the quilt. I'm actually making nice square cuts, which is very important. But I never thought about using one on my smaller mat. It was 24 by 36, and a 24 always works. Seldom did I use the full width of my quilt with a full-size ruler. So anyways, this has been a, a good learning lesson for me, and uh, I, I'm so glad I have this. It's working great. So if you have trouble sometimes, or you make a lot of big quilts, getting a larger ruler can definitely be helpful. Okay, so I am going to cut across from side to side. And let me come over here and get this taken care of. Now, my piano borders, I had such great expectations of them ending in a certain place and all that kind of a thing, didn't quite happen. And in part, that's because um, I decided not to do this extra little border on this side. And, and I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll have, you know, some skinny ends at the end of my, uh, at the end of my piano keys. And I'm all right with that. It works. But I do see that this piece is, and if you look at my quilt, see how this particular um, block protruded quite a bit more than these? So that definitely does need to be trimmed back. And I always look at that to make sure I'm not cutting off something I'm going to need later. But my lines are lining up, and I'm good with the straight here, and I'm nice and straight over there. And I'm just going to go ahead and cut that corner off. And then I'll come back and do the other. And that's it. So uh, squaring up your quilt is not... Oh, I can't pick it up. It's stuck. <laughs> okay, this is crazy. Well, that was a first. My ruler was sliding across and I couldn't get my fingernail underneath to lift the corner. That was too funny. Okay, so now we'll get this part done. You know, there's just always something that you never expect, isn't it? And you think, good grief, what's going on? All right, I'm going to bring that across because I want to uh, cut that batting. Okay, so we're here, and I'm making sure everything's nice and square, and it looks good. I'm going to come across here, and there we are. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat the one, the uh, same thing here, and then I'll get the binding on. I'll show you a, a couple steps on the binding, what I do to get that going, and we'll be finished. I'm going to have a reversible quilt to show you. I'm so excited. This is a first. All right, let me get this finished. I'm sewing around my quilt and getting the binding attached and realize I forgot to bring you along with me. So I'm on about corner number three, I think, and I just want to show you real quick what I'm doing. Um, I sewed all the way to the edge within a quarter of an inch. I leave a quarter inch on the back and you can kind of see right there because that's going to allow me to do my miter corner. And when I get to this point, I bring my folded there it is, my folded binding right in line so that's straight and I'll just kind of finger press that in place. And as I bring this top down, I want it to I'll take my gloves off. I want it to be just above the edge of the quilt. So I'm going to bring it down like this. And you see how, I mean, we're not even talking an eighth of an inch. That little bit is just enough to get that miter to turn nice and sharp so we get a good corner. And then I line this edge up here and I'm going to sew from the very top and come all the way down. Now, I do apologize. It looks like my neighbor's lawn care service just showed up. So we may have some buzzing in the background. I apologize, but we'll try and get through this quick before they get completely set up. Okay, and I'm just going to sew 
so all the way down and I will finish this edge go around the next corner and then we will meet up let me just make sure yep I do have one more corner and then we'll meet up and we'll finish off the binding so this is the uh, fast and furious binding today I didn't forget you this time I'm back and I'm at my last corner and I've sewn all the way to within a quarter inch of the edge of the quilt so now I'm going to take my folded binding and I'm going to draw it up so it's in line with my quilt and kind of finger press this down. I'm going to hold my fingernail right there on the edge on that corner right here. And then as I bring my binding down nice and straight, I can just line that up. Now the other thing, you do want to make sure that this fold underneath is straight with this. If it pulls under too far, that's going to throw off your miter. It doesn't happen often, but if the fabric, if you're pulling it down and adjusting it, maybe gets a little twisted, that can happen. So just make sure that when you lift this, these folds are on top of each other. And I'm going to do my quarter inch and I come, I start off the fabric and sew onto it. So I come up over that, uh, that fold and it gets a good good strong hold right there and I'm going to get this on so now the next thing I'm going to do is just sew down to where the binding is where I started and then I'll show you how we'll join them isn't it always interesting to see what comes up when you're quilting and recording at the same time so I get to the end of where my two pieces will come together and it's fine we're good but look at what I have right here. The seam is almost exactly in the same place. I love when this is long enough that I can just cut this piece off and piece it together. That's not going to work. But what I am going to do is cut this one back so that the seam's going to be there. There's nothing I can do about that. But at least this way, they're not going to be right on top of each other. There'll at least be a little space between them. Now, what I usually do is I will come between my sewn edges of my quilt um, that's open between the binding pieces, and I'll join my pieces at approximately the middle, which is right here. So I'm going to put my finger there, and this one goes past the center. So what I'm going to do is cut about two and a half inches off this. That way I have a, a nice square. And I just kind of need to use my scissors. It's about there. All right, so I just gained a two and a half inch square. That's never a bad thing. Now what I'm going to do is bring the piece down from above. I want to show you how to measure your cut because when you have the first piece cut, it's always a question, where does the second one get cut? So I'm going to show you how we do that. First we bring this piece down and I work the piece from the that I'm sewing on and I work from the back and I lay that and I lay it out so it's, it's pretty much flat. Tell you what, I'm going to put a pin right there so it doesn't move while we're doing this. And I'm going to put the pin right there where the seam is. Okay. Now the other thing I need to do is lay this out and see where it overlaps. All right, so this is where it's already been sewn. I'm just going to fold it and put it where it's going to lay. And then I'm going to bring this one on top, but I'm going to allow myself some visibility here because I want to see where the edge of the binding is because this binding is going to be cut at, whoops, where we go? at the uh, the two and a half inch point. So if your binding is two and a half inches wide, we need to add a two and a half inch, essentially seam allowance, because we're going to make a bias seam. We need a square in order to get the diagonal. So we need to have a two and a half inch uh, room to work with here. Now, what you can always do, and it's super easy, is just take the end, the long end that's left hanging, and line it up right here 
where that binding is. So right here I have my original binding that's sewn down. I put this one on top and then I take this square and I line it up there. Now that's going to show me where my length is. Let me grab a pen. I wasn't expecting any of this. Okay, so we're going to just put our marker right there. So this is two and a half inches from here to there. And I measured it with the end of the binding. Alternatively, you can do the same thing with a ruler. So it depends on what's handy. If you don't have anything to measure, you've got the end of your fabric, so you don't need to worry about it. And so if I line that right up there, see I get my two and a half inch right here. So what I do now is I will cut this piece and I am good to go. There we are. So I have a little bit extra here. Now, in order to get this together, I need to overlap them, but these pieces are equal to the width of this quilt right here. And this quilt is going to want to stretch your fabric out, which will make it hard to sew these. So what I do is I just fold this excess right here and I just pin it off to the side. I fold it up and I pin it to the quilt. That way, see how these two pieces just lay nice and flat? So much easier to work with. You notice that my seam is all the way over here now. So by cutting this first piece a little bit shorter, I was able to give myself a little room between those seams. And I'm going to put these together. Actually, let me turn it this way, the way we're going to sew it. This piece comes out, then this one we put right side together. Okay, here is a really important tip. It is not uncommon that one of these pieces get twisted as you're putting it down. And let me show you how that happens. We have this binding. We want to open it up and lay it down flat. And you see how this right side, this is coming right through here. So this is my outside and it's in line with the binding that's already attached. If one is going to get mixed up, it's going to be this one because it's easy to grab and go the wrong way. So what I wanna do is open it from the inside just like this, but I can't tell you how easy it is to grab it and go this way. And when you do that and you go to sew this, you get a twist in your binding and it's not going to go back together no matter what you do so you want to always make sure that everything is nice and straight in line in order to keep your binding uh, the way you want it and put it together now even though i've measured these and i know it's the right length i will leave a little bit of overhang first so i can see where I'm sewing to because I'm not worried about marking a line. I'm just going to sew corner to corner, but it's also going to snug it up a little bit. By leaving that overhang, it's like I'm taking a, a bigger seam allowance so that this will fit just a little bit tighter because nothing is worse than going to put your binding on and realizing it's loose. And when it's loose, then it tends to pucker and buckle up on you. So I'm going to remove that pin that I have in my quilt. And I'm going to open this out. And oh my gosh, look at what I did. I did it. I did the twist. I did not even do it intentionally. I wasn't paying attention. Okay, fortunately, I did not cut this because I need to go back and do it the other way. Okay, here comes the seam ripper. I'll be right back. All right, that was too funny. My husband and I had a good chuckle over that when I told him, here I'm showing folks how not to do a thing and go ahead and do it anyways, unintentionally. I thought I was all set up, ready to go. All right, so I'm going to sew back corner to corner. <laughs> and let's hope this works this time. I just can't tell you how grateful I am I didn't cut those corners off that seam allowance. All right, now, this is the part where it's supposed to work, and you pull this out, 
and everything lays nice and flat like that. So you've actually seen it both ways, and you know what not to do, and when you do it, you know what to do. You just have to rip it out and realign things and put it back where it needs to be. All right, so I'm just going to finish this up, and uh, I can show you a bit of the binding. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. I'll show you how I attach my binding. Not attach it, but actually finish it. So let me uh, get this done, and when I get that ready to go, I'll be right back. To finish off my binding, I'm going to come to one of the corners. It doesn't matter which one. You just start at a corner, and we're going to open this fold and just turn it over like this. And you see you get this wonderful miter right there. And I'm going to kind of finger press as I go. I don't press this in advance. I just sort of finger press it. And I'll run my finger along the back and my thumb and sort of squeeze it. And it, it does uh, finger press that fabric nicely. And it keeps it so it lays flat while I'm sewing and that seam allowance stays to the side where I want it because I want it to be inside the binding. Now I'm going to take my fabric initially and fold it over. It's hard with the black and white to see, but I want to make sure that this fold covers that stitching right there. So I want to line that up so it's going to go over. Now I'm particularly, whoops, I've got a little thread here, um, always concerned with the corner. Let me show you why. After I cut this, you can see there's extra threads in there. But after you're finished sewing, you've got this seam and you want to make sure that's covered. So I will come in and I will place that binding so it covers the thread. And then I'm going to pin that right there. So I know that's right where it needs to be. And I want to catch that binding and just sort of pin it like this. And then when I start coming down, I know that that corner will be covered. The rest I can do by hand. You can pin it, you can clip it, whatever works for you. But I find that spot right there is where it's going to be the trickiest. So I'm going to go ahead and line this up here get my binding where I need it so I can feel it and that's the other thing I do as I'm sewing my binding I should be able to feel that fold of the binding on the other side right here so what I'm doing is feeling that edge so right along this seam I can feel that edge of the fold and I know that my binding is underneath where I'm going to be sewing now I'm going to start my needle in just maybe not even an eighth of an inch from this seam line. I'll, I'll come right up here. If you prefer, you can certainly, you know, sew down, you know, in the ditch, but that's not my my thing. I don't I don't do just about anything in the ditch. My my, <laughs> my in the ditch is, is not anything that uh, I care to show off. So let me go ahead and get my needle in place. And I'm going to move it over just a littlest bit. Now, I'm doing a buttonhole stitch. So what it's going to do, if you're watching, it's going to sew down two stitches. I have to be real careful because I have a pin right there. And then it's going to sew out two stitches. And it's a great reinforcement for the binding, but mostly I just like the look of it. For years, I hand sewed my bindings and I just kind of got tired of doing that. I like I like the look of the machine and I can do this in, in half the time. I'm obviously not a very fast sewer. So let me go ahead and get to the other end and I'll show you how we go around a corner. As I'm sewing along, I realize there's one other thing I wanted to mention. I don't do the uh, decorative stitch to attach the binding on the back side by sewing in the ditch. But what I do is I line the inside of my presser foot right next to that seam. And because there's a ridge there where it folds over, the fabric lifts, that presser foot just glides along very easily and it makes my stitching line so nice and straight. So just watch how that lines up right there. And it really doesn't take any effort. As long as you're feeding your fabric in nice and straight, 
it's just going to follow right along that line. Remember, double check to make sure that your binding is folded over and you can feel it underneath. And we'll take it as far as the corner and I'll show you how we're going to go around. What I do is wrap this around, I fold it over, make sure it's covered, and then I'm just going to hold it like this. I'm just folding it in one direction right now. And I know my binding is in place. Okay, so I get to about within an inch to an inch and a half, and I stop with the needle down. I'm going to fold this, I'm going to finger press it, I'm going to fold this side under, and I'm going to pin that about an inch down, and I want to pin it so that this open edge is held tight in place. So now what I'll do is fold this all the way to the edge and just pull this one over the top. Now you can certainly come in and pin this. I have some threads, some loose threads there. Let me cut those out of the way. There we are. So let me show you if you want to put a second pin in. So we've got this lined up. It's covering the seam. We bring this nice and straight. And we want to kind of tuck it in next to the seam allowance. That little tuck will give you a nice tight miter fold. But you see how that seam is out? That means I need to fold in just a little bit more. And so I'm going to take this and sort of get it where I want and pull this down. Sometimes it takes a little bit of manipulation to get everything right where you want it. And then I'm going to put a pin in right here. Be careful you don't stab yourself. Actually, there's so much there. I think I'm just going to hold it by hand. All right, so we should be good. I'm just going to hold it nice and tight. And we're just going to finish our way up. And I sew past the edge of the binding. I go up just a little bit. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm using a decorative stitch that has some width to it. When I turn my fabric, then I'm in place to go ahead and start coming down right where I want to be. This is already pinned, so I'm just going to make sure everything feels right under there. And I'm going to sew as far as the pin. And stop with my needle down. And we'll come down a few more inches and I'll show you how the back of that corner looks. There we are. And I'm going to line up right here with the inside of my presser foot and the seam. And here is what our mitered corner looks like. So it looks great on the front. And you can see how this turns right at the corner and it stays right along the edge. And it does the same on the back. So it comes up this way and then we turn. Now, see where this fold is. I want you to see where that fold lifts on that side is opposite on this side. So when these two come together in the corner, that creates a really nice point where those folds meet and it disperses the fabric inside so it sort of lays down nice and flat and it doesn't get bulky. If you find your fold is on the same side where, see again, this lifts here, you don't want this side to be on top. You want it to be opposite and then that way the fold will be nice and neat. And that's it. So now all I need to do is go around the rest of the quilt and this is finished. I can't wait to show you the pictures. Here are both sides of my first ever reversible quilt. I love how this turned out. Oh my gosh, these colors are so perfect together. 
and they look wonderful back to back. These fun borders on each quilt just bring in so much color and interest. It's, it's a great, great finish. I'm really excited about this. Thank you for hanging in, in with me. I know this was a really long video, but there was a lot to cover, and I hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned a thing or two. I know I had a lot of fun. Thanks so much for joining me. As always, it's a pleasure having you here with me. Have a fabulous rest of your day.